This is an oral history with uh, Dr. Bill Kemper, and we're in his home. And uh, Dr. Kemper is, has done a lot of work with Rocky Flats, and we're going to be talking about that. Uh, today's date is uh, February 16, 2005. Thank you very much, well, Dr. Thank Kemper. You. Can you say when and where you were born? Yes. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and mother gave me a nice birthday, January the 1st, 1911. Oh. So it's 1111. Oh, great. It's my birthday. And uh, That's wonderful. Baltimore's a very interesting city there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's, uh, Baltimore's a seaport, and uh, it provides a, a place where ships can get uh, fairly close to the the center of the U.S., so it makes it a valuable seaport, and it, it's an industrial city. Uh -huh. Lots of, uh, sure you want to do that over? I know, that's sorry. We'll just clip this on so it'll... I'm sure it was picking you up anyway. There. Here's the, the questions here. Uh, I'm just going to make a note here that... Um, Want me to do that over, Dorothy? No, this is fine. Uh, Mr. Jim Stone right. is also here uh, yeah. and, and, next to you. But just just continue. You were telling about all right. Baltimore. All right. Have a seat. Okay. I uh, uh, went to a public school in Baltimore, uh, first uh, six grades were at uh, school number 61, a uh, very nice school and a fun place to be, and, and uh, wonderful teachers. Uh, I could tell you about them now, but uh, I'm afraid it would take too long. Uh -huh. I, uh, what was your family like? My family? Yes. Well, I had, uh, I'm the oldest of was three brothers, and we have only one left now, and uh, I'm the oldest, and uh, we uh, lived in, in this nice area of Baltimore, nothing special, row houses, which Baltimore's famous for, marble steps, which uh, uh, not so much in our neighborhood, but it actually was a poorer, poorer neighborhood where the women used to go out and scrub the steps every afternoon. In the evening, they'd sit on it. Bowlers can be fairly warm in the summer, particularly before we had air conditioning. And uh, I was anxious to move out of Baltimore because it was too hot. But uh, air conditioning made that livable. Uh, the, uh, you were, we were talking about public school. I went first to public school number 61. Then they had a, a very nice uh, junior high. Uh, it was called, it was known by its number, number 49. And it was famous, this particular junior high. Uh, it accelerated students. And uh, we could do the first two grades of uh, junior high and first year of high school in two years, those three years in two. The principal was a very lovely lady, uh, Miss Hodd. She also taught music besides being the principal of the school. And she, she was very well known for a number of years. She's no longer with us, uh, but uh, most the prominent citizens of Baltimore went to uh, 49 school and uh, remember Miss Hodge. She also taught music. But uh, uh, my mother, who was a very friendly person, uh, quickly made friends with Miss Hodge and they used to go on summer vacations together. Uh, mother uh, drove a car and they had tour up in New England coast of uh, Nova Scotia and Maine, and uh, it's, I suppose Miss Hodd is almost forgotten now, but she was well known to the Baltimore citizens, and uh, 
there were several uh, 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 reunions that the school had for honor Miss Hogg, uh -huh. and uh, she was very well liked. Very well liked. Uh, and well, did you go on to college? Uh, th yes. Then I went from uh, uh, junior high to high school, then to college, and uh, I went to Johns Hopkins. I was very fortunate, Johns Hopkins, to have gotten a, uh, a scholarship by competitive examination. I, uh, I, uh, as we left the exam, uh, walked part of the way home with a young man who later became my best friend. His name is Charles Cohen, a very brilliant man, a mathematician. He, he studied geology at Hopkins, but he went on to Africa and uh, worked in the, in the outback uh, there uh, ex exploring for uh, minerals. And uh, then when the war began, he came back to the uh, United States uh, left Africa, but uh, he and I became, we walked home after taking this exam for a competitive exam. I was sure he had gotten it because he was so good in mathematics, but I guess he was a little weak on languages. I was able to use Latin as my language, a second uh, thing. It was a competitive examination. and. Uh, uh, the Latin was uh, permitted as a, a language, although of course it's not a contemporary language. Uh, you want me to touch on something else, Dorothy? Sure, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, this uh, Charles Cohen and I became very good friends. Then uh, during World War II, he returned from Africa and uh, took a job in South Carolina. and. Uh, I uh, persuaded him that he ought to give up his geology for the time being and uh, come to work for the Navy because he was so good in mathematics. And uh, I was at the time uh, in the Navy and working at the Naval Proving Ground in Dalgren, Virginia. And uh, I persuaded the head of our department to, uh, uh, when Charles decided to uh, get a commission, take a commission in the Navy. I persuaded Dr. Bramble, our department head, to uh, request that he be assigned to Dalgren because he, Charles was a geologist but so good in mathematics. And uh, when uh, he was, uh, I was telling Dr. Bramble about uh, Charles's qualifications in math and Dr. Bramble's assistant, a young lady, was there, and she said, oh, Bill, you're exaggerating a bit. Nobody's that good. <laughs> but after she, Dr. Bramble did get him to come to Dalgren, get him assigned to Dalgren, why, uh, she, she later told me, she said, you were right. <laughs> and, uh, and what did you do in the Navy? Were you well, still in at Johns Hopkins? The, I was uh, I got at this commission in the Navy, but I uh, uh, was then uh, I was first assigned to go to uh, MIT to study uh, aeronautical uh, na and navigation. Did I was to, then after I finished the course, I was then to teach it, but. Uh, uh, in, in, instead, I uh, met the head of this department, and he w w got me aside. He wanted me to come to work at Dalgren Naval Proving Ground, where I worked in exterior ballistics, which is the uh, uh, making of aiming tables for guns. All the big guns were used the Navy, the aiming tables that we made for them. We had to first make the measurements. The guns were fired, and we measured the range of the projectile and uh, other characteristics of it. And from this, we made aiming tables that were sent to the fleet 
to use with the guns and projectiles. Was this before the Second World War? This was World War II. This was. Uh -huh. And uh, then uh, after uh, uh, a after uh, the war, I still continued working at the Naval Proving Ground, and uh, very very interesting uh, experiences and associations. Uh, I, I met some of the uh, prominent people in that field, like uh, uh, oh, I uh, can't think of his name right now, but it's, it doesn't matter. And I was out at the Bikini atom bomb test uh, first at, at sea atom bomb test, and uh, I had an interesting assignment there. Uh, I was uh, sent out there as a uh, radiological safety monitor to uh, measure uh, how long men could stay in certain locations before they would get too much radiation. Uh, and uh, uh, when the, f the bikini test consisted of essentially two tests. First was a drop of a bomb from the airplane, uh, and it was to burst over the center of a target array that was the ships were distributed, so that they would each uh, uh, get a measurable amount of exposure, and uh, we hoped to find out the effect of uh, uh, atom bombs on ships at sea. But unfortunately, the first bomb, which was dropped from a plane, missed the target by a rather big amount. And uh, then the question became, why did this bomb miss? The Navy had the responsibility for designing the bomb, and the Air Force, or the Army Air Corps was then, uh, said, uh, well, it, well, it was the Navy's fault for not designing it properly so that it didn't fly truly. And the Navy said, no, it wasn't. It was a bombing error on a part of the personnel. And did the bomb drop? The man that made the bomb drop was the same man who had made the drop, two drops over Japan, or actually only the first of the two. Uh, the name slips from mine at the moment. But uh, the question here was, whose fault this was? And this question, interested uh, a lot of the people who were connected with it, you know, all the way up to President Truman, and he wanted to know whose fault it was. And uh, I was uh, given a job. Uh, this wasn't my primary assignment when I went there, but it turned out that because of my experience, Dr. Sawyer, who was the test director, asked me to find out why the bomb missed the target. Uh, and uh, I had to work with to fi find the answer to this question some photographs that were taken as a bomb is falling over the f over the ships uh, right after it was released. And from this picture, I could tell uh, where it was aimed to fall. And the question was, did it go where it was supposed to fall, or uh, was it just uh, uh, a bad uh, information that the bomber used to uh, release a bomb. Maybe he didn't release it at the right spot. And uh, we had to, the test was done out in the Pacific, out at Bikini. And uh, out there, Dr. Sawyer, uh, when the bomb missed the target, Dr. Sawyer was the test director. He uh, knew me. And what I, kind of work I'd been doing, he asked me to take some photographs that showed the bomb just after it released from the plane and tell whether it was aimed at the right spot or not. And uh, worked day and night for about a week on this, using very crude uh, equipment I used uh, uh, for making measurements, not a uh, comparator, but a uh, it just simply a ruler and a magnifying glass. That's all I had to work with. 
and for the calculus. Were you studying the radiation part? No, 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 this was not. I, I was sent out there originally as just one of the radiological monitors. And, we, and there I was, could tell, uh, give information how long men could stay on certain ships. But uh, when a question came up of why the bomb missed the target, because of my experience, Dr. Sawyer asked me to use some film that was taken after showing the bomb falling. And uh, I worked on this question for uh, a week or so. Uh, no real equipment for making measurements instead of using a scientific instrument. All I used was a ruler and a magnifying glass and so on. And uh, the, actually the answer I got was it was a little bit of both. It was a little bit of bombing error on a part of the pilot and, uh, and um, the bombardier. And it was also, uh, and this is what the Air Force claimed, that it was the bomb was not too well designed and it uh, didn't fly very true. And this bomb, you can see a uh, similar one at the museum in Los Alamos. It's known as the Fat Boy. This bomb was the Fat Boy. And the Fat Boy was at fault for part of uh, this bombing error. And it was a rather serious error because thousands of dollars had been spent on it tests as thousands of men were out in the Pacific for it and a uh, number of ships had as many ships out of Bikini for this test as probably we have in the Navy today as far as numbers are concerned. Uh, well, uh, the answer I got was it was a little bit of both errors, partly due to uh, a bomb design. It was not a well-designed bomb and uh, partly bombing error. And uh, I just had to make these measurements out, out of Bikini with a, sli uh, with a slide rule for my calculator and uh, a ruler for making the measurements. Uh, but uh, later the t test was, uh, the measurements were, were reproduced, were repeated at Aberdeen, the Proving Ground, and uh, they found out essentially the same answers I did, that it was a little bit of both. And that was an interesting experience. I have somewhere in this file of papers, uh, we had a party on a beach for some of the leaders of the test, and uh, got to bet out who were at this party to autograph these uh, this uh, list of men, there were about 15 of us, and one of them is uh, uh, this uh, Army General, uh, what was his name? Uh, oh, it'll, it'll, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, well, let's skip it, okay. if I can find it how, here. How see. did you, uh, what brought you to the Denver area? Pardon? What brought you to the Denver area? Oh, uh, when I got married, uh, I was at the time working at the Naval Proving Ground in Dalgren, Virginia. And uh, when I married Marcia, she had been teaching school out here in Denver, and she wanted to return. She got me to retire as soon as I could, it was eligible, and uh, returned to Denver when we got out of here. She found that Denver had changed a lot in the three or four year period that she had been living in Dalgren, and she no longer was quite so fond of it. The uh, national parks, and we go to Rocky Mountain National Park and so on, were uh, uh, now, when, we, when she got back, quite crowded. They weren't as, quite as nice as they were when she left, uh, but uh, we decided stay here anyway. And what year was that? Uh, gosh, I'd have to do a little arithmetic. <laughs> uh, it, it was must have been about 1975, yeah. around that period. Mm -hmm. And uh, Denver changed a great deal in that time. There's so much more traffic here, and the national parks nearby yeah. were crowded. 
And as you may know, you can't drive and park right at the lake in Rocky Mountain National Park, but you have to park elsewhere and then yeah. take a bus that the government furnishes to yeah. come into the park. Yeah. Uh, now, should we change to something else there? Yeah. How did you get involved with Rocky Flats? Oh, uh, well, I guess because of my experience out at Bikini, where I was a radiological safety monitor and working there, uh, the people that were running this, uh, it was the Rocky Flats uh, Cleanup Commission that uh, asked me to uh, join their group. Uh, unfortunately, that's where I met my good friend Jim Stone there. Let me just get a, a I'll just yeah. get the two of you there. Yeah. Jim also was a member of this uh, group, the Rocky Flats Cleanup Commission. And, uh, can, you, can you describe how that got started and what its purpose was? And you can chime in if you want. What, what was the question, Jim? How did Rocky Flats get started? The Cleanup Commission. Oh, yeah. how did the Cleanup Commission get started? Well, Jim got in a little bit late compared to myself. Uh, we were sure glad when he did join our group. But uh, uh, it got started. Some people were very much against the, the uh, using Rocky Flats as a... Uh, uh, area where the public could have access. They felt it was too, too contaminated. But uh, uh, that... That would be the plans for cleanup after it was closed down? Uh, Probably all the way through from the original siting, um, but mainly... Answer the question. We got hold of it. Go ahead, sir. Uh, but mainly when it was shut down, they, uh, they didn't want to make it a game reserve uh, for people to visit because they knew it was contaminated. But in those days, they couldn't admit that there was contamination. And so we were trying to police it and clean it up at the same time. And this was after production had stopped? Yes. So it was maybe about 19, early 90s? This was a controversial sub subject also. Uh, many of us thought that the uh, place was too contaminated to turn it over to the public to picnic and walk around there. And they couldn't and admit it, and they couldn't deny the... Uh, potential use of it also. So this uh, cleanup commission was made up of citizens? All citizens, yes. From the various cities around there, all had representatives because they all had ideas of bringing uh, commerce and whatnot into uh, the land. 6,200 acres of beautiful land, really overlooking Denver, but uh, they didn't really appreciate the hazard involved, and uh, we did. Yeah. Who, who, did, who was on the commission with you when it first started? It was Jim, no, uh, he came in a little bit later. Uh, I was working with the group for about, oh, six months, I think, before we got recruited to Jim to join us. And uh, Jim has some special interests, particularly the uh, some of the ponds out there that are contaminated, and also some sites where some of the radioactive material was buried, which is, I don't know whether it's come to light yet, but uh, <laughs> at the time, <laughs> Yeah, no, they, they buried it pretty good, and uh, I was an environmental consulting engineer, and uh, it I'll, worked. I will make reference uh, at the end of this tape to your um, 
oral history where you talk about that more. But why don't you say more right. about that now? So I, I was uh, working out there and I knew of the problems because that was my job as the lead safety engineer. All right, so uh, as these things would come up, I'd have to bring them up. The problems, but you can't do that. And the politicians and whatnot. <laughs> what the I things, couldn't accept that. One of the things that Jim called attention to was the fact that the flu ducts, which uh, carry the ventilation air from uh, one site where they were working on the uh, uh, bomb, uh, making small bombs, uh, and the, they had to do the work on putting the bomb together and machining it and so on under in what we call hoods, H-O-O-D-S, uh, so as not to let this escape into the air. But uh, some a year or so after Jim joined the group, he got the FBI to go out there and investigate, and they found that these pi uh, air duct pipes uh, that were carrying air from the hoods uh, to filters and then to stacks where it was released, uh, he found they found that there was enough. Uh, radioactive material in these pipe ducts to make several bombs, quite a few. And that would have been plutonium, right? In the in the ducts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, uh, there was a, a ruling that any time some outsider wanted to come in and look around and uh, they could not go above the ceiling. And uh, of course, that piqued my curiosity, and why not? Well, it might be a little dusty up there. So, when I got the authority to go anywhere I wanted to, I looked up there, and uh, sure enough, there was enough sandy material that looked like a desert, a wind blown desert. And I said, you know, you know, you're gathering quite a bit of radioactive material here that had better be cleaned up rather than uh, continue the accumulation. And so they wouldn't allow anybody to look there. Well, I did prevail. I, I did have the authority to get pictures that I wanted to document something from my report. And I did. And when I showed that, that was quite an uh, awakening. And also with the, with the ponds, when they uh, when they mixed, well, they were there to put this material on a pond to settle it and try to condense it, and then ship it to California for burial. They had to encase it in something so it wouldn't contaminate the groundwater. And uh, the idea was. You can guess it with cement. Well, in watching them make cement, and you guys have no idea how to make cement, you can't mix that much water or cement and expect it to harden. And uh, so uh, they, they, um, I had a lot of authority within my own department. But I didn't have any authority as far as the plant was concerned. And they did just as they damn well pleased. Anyway, and when it passed my desk for approval, I said, this process will not work. You've got to take each phase of this process and optimize it to where you make hard concrete by specifications. It's 3,000 pounds a square inch. That's pretty your concrete so that when you bury it you can expect it to stay intact and won't leak out into the soil yeah. so anyway as God would have it uh, they, they uh, brought some out and shipped them in the regular shipment 
and one of the carts tipped over. I didn't tip it over. <laughs> I might have wished it over, but anyway, it fell over and spilled all over the gunk all over the pavement. And this this was uh, toxic, what mixed waste? It was mixed waste and cement that, that With, wasn't even close. Yeah. And but it, it, had had, a, it had some radioactive plutonium. A lot of radioactive plutonium in it. Very, very deadly stuff. And we also had, and I had a letter back from uh, the site that as you said, this was concrete, this isn't it? Concrete, it's mush. Yeah, I know. I'm trying. I'm trying to correct that. Well, so that that went on, and they investigated, and sure enough, that was wrong. As more things were exposed, I objected to management hiring people that didn't know how to manage it and didn't know how to do engineering either. And one time. My supervisor was chewing on a young engineer who was a very fine young engineer. And uh, I told him to take him into his office and chew him if he wanted to. That was his prerogative. But you're disturbing the 40 or 50 people here. And he got upset at me and uh, started chewing on me. Well, I'm not in the habit of arguing with people in charge, so I just turned around and gave him the Roman salute and walked out. One mistake that Jim called uh -huh. attention to out there was that a lot of the things they did, uh, new, new facilities that they uh, made to handle the material and to dispose of some of it and to uh, immobilize it uh, why they didn't uh, didn't perform small-scale tests to start with but they just went full scale on what they thought would work and it turns out that some of the some of the things they thought would work would work too well that pertained to now did you come across that in the cleanup commission's work no, uh, no. It was part of the background. Everybody had yeah. a little bit of background to contribute to this thing, and the reason they joined the Cleanup Commission was to help expose that experience to this group of interested people. I see. Because there weren't many people interested in it to begin with. So, and these were all just citizens. They weren't people who worked there. They were just um, well, they might interested advocates. Yeah, see, they, and I a lot of them are I former employees there. I see. And were discharged for various reasons. Oh. The uh, union was upset. Everyone was upset. But there wasn't enough concern to, or, or any opportunity to litigate. I keep saying, as God would have it, I have a great faith in God. That summer, the Congress enacted the False Claims Act, and a friend of mine, an attorney, said, Jim, this is was done for your benefit. You don't know it, and they don't know it. <laughs> but uh, they passed a law that said any time a contractor is doing a, a big project, multi-billion dollars, and not accomplishing what, they, what we expected them to do, build this uh, nuclear plant, nuclear bomb, bomb plant, safely, and to protect the workers and pay them right, pay for their medical problems, and do that. I've forgotten under whose authority the Clean Up Commission was established. Was it the governor, or <coughs> do you happen to know? The Department of Energy was the main part. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, uh, it, the Department of Energy. So it was started yeah. officially as a yes. Department of Energy yes. thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did they, appoint, <coughs> did they appoint people to be on it? Yeah, they hired people. To, yeah, but, but, but as it turned out, a lot of those people were close friends of friends in politics. It was ranked with uh, 
blood sucker he was. Um, and uh, they didn't know anything and didn't try to learn anything. They thought they could hire it. outside consultants, uh, Bill and I. And, uh, okay. <coughs> so, so part of Bill's role was to tell them the truth about things. Is that is that what you did? Well, we had something to do. We let a couple of contracts, I believe. Uh, I know we let one contract to uh, uh, find out the extent to which uh, plutonium was in the soil, and we had uh, a. Uh, yeah, they just buried it in, indiscriminately wherever they wanted to. They were just hiding it. Is what they were doing. They're still doing that today. Well. But they hired a group of people to, uh, first of all, to do the sampling, take samples of the soil in different locations, and to take these samples under very carefully specified conditions so that they were, uh, could be reproduced at any time. That is the sampling, uh, how deep you dug and uh, uh, how you handled the, the material that you dug up, and it was then sent to uh, a gentleman whose name I forget, but one of the professors at the University of uh, Northern Colorado, I think it was, and uh, they did a very competent job of analysis of, this so of these soil samples. Uh -huh. I would say that their analysis was excellent, although some other aspects of the test are subject to some uh, question. Uh, well, but your role in this then was because you had professionally done work similar to this. Uh, well, I, I think I was uh, selected to be a member of the group real early because of the experience I had out at the Bikini working with radio, radiological material. Right. And uh, there were some very competent people in this group. Uh, the uh, Ellison sisters. Uh, they were uh, very, for people who, that wasn't their area of work, uh -huh. they, they managed to get a, a very coherent and excellent uh, background for, for their work. And mm -hmm. I have a great deal of confidence in what they say and what they did. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the course of my work at the the lead engineer in this mechanical uh, engineering department. My supervisor wasn't paying attention to him, and there wasn't much I could do other than when we had these incidents of accidents, and he had the my report predicting it. Then he was in trouble. And after I got fired, and then we had the False Claims Act come into existence, mm -hmm. and the government agencies asking what's going on out there, then I filed the False Claims Act suit against Rockwell. And, uh, <coughs> and in that suit, which I think you described pretty, pretty much in, in the oral history we did, uh, did you have uh, Bill Kemper, was he a part of that at all? Yeah, all of, we've always talked these things over yeah, okay. in the cleanup commission. And uh, a lot of these people from the, the, the citizenry around had neighbors and relatives that were affected by it and no recourse really. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to have a medical program where they were taken in, but they really weren't. They were in sad shape. They are to this day still in sad shape. Well, so there was a, a lot of camaraderie amongst this group because they all had a personal evidence and stake in it. Uh huh. Uh, are you speaking, Jim, of the fact that some of the people who came to our meetings were invited to come to our meetings and give their story, uh, had not been able to get any hearing uh, from any official group before we called them, and uh, 
So this was very important to them. Yes, it was important to them. They had to tell but somebody. They, they had also uh, the experience of uh, having this uh, supposed contamination occur right in their backyard. And uh, they were very much concerned for living in such a place. And uh, I guess they had already bought the property and there was nothing they could do about it. Gee, as an engineer, I gotta explain that what we're blowing on these ducts is carrying the air, and these glove boxes are supposed to contain uh, this equipment that we're cleaning and whatnot. It's supposed to be airtight. And I conduct a test, but you're not all the lights. Turn the lights on in those glove boxes, and you can see rays of lights come out of it. Obviously, that's not airtight. One time Coors came out and said, well, and that, that caused quite a stir, but nothing happened. Coors came out and said, we can, we'd like to bid on those. We can make those airtight. Fine. Can I get a copy of your specs? So they came to my engineering department and we don't even have any specifications on it. But I'll tell you what we have. Uh, we need a box to contain this much volume and it needs to be airtight. And we're going to blow through it and we have these high class he called HEPA filters, high efficiency particular arresters. <coughs> and we never really put together an airtight system. That's all we want to do is so that they be handled through glove boxes and uh, passed on to filters and contained and uh, packaged and uh, disposed of. Well, in a number of areas, uh, uh, we had people come in, and every time we would do it, I would uh, demonstrate it and document my evidence. So an office, you know, they're reading it all the time, the pictures and, and whatnot. And uh, finally, when I, when I got fired and we got the, a couple of weeks later, we got the False Claims Act, and uh, we fired our litigation. Well, one of the first stages of the litigation is you have to be the original source of the information. You can't have read it in the paper or have hearsay or anything like that. Well, that was my job. And uh, I would have quit if I could afford, but <laughs> engineers don't get rid of, don't get very rich, do they? <laughs> anyway, we, uh, the, the FBI investigates you and listen to your story, then they do an investigation. And they went through top to bottom. Now just a point of clarification, was the cleanup commission already operating before the FBI or did that come after? They were meeting, trying to find out what the problem was. Uh -huh. And we didn't really have the evidence of the problem yet. I had it, but I couldn't document it yet. That's why I said, if you if you live as long as Bill and I have, now Bill's 10 years my senior, but uh, uh, I'm catching up with him here. <laughs> uh, you find that God does move in ways that will help you if you've got a little imagination and are determined to do what you think you got to do. And that's the key. Well. We had the opportunity. We, uh, we did it. The uh, FBI confirmed it and wrote, wrote their report. And then I had to testify in uh, Washington to the powers that be there. And uh, they formed, they did their own uh, litigation. And then at some point in time, after you've proven that you were the original source and your evidence is confirmed by the FBI, you file a false under the False Claims Act. And that says that the government will correct it by causing the contractor to pay three times the cost of cleaning it up. All right. And the relator gets a third of that. Well, that's 
that's fine. <laughs> but we haven't had a dime yet in 20 years. But uh, I'm going to fool them. I'm going to live to be another 20 years still. <laughs> and then I'll be 110. Bill, okay. did you help uh, Jim Stone with kind of deciding to yeah. do this? And I, I had no uh, different relation in my work with Jim Stone and with any other members. We, we were not a two two man uh, okay. little group that were yeah. working inside. But no, we, we just we conferred a lot on the the uh, uh -huh. situation. Uh -huh. What can you do? Can you just dig it up and put it in the bag? No, you got you got certain precautions, uh -huh. both in working with it and in not breathing it. See, we've got the prevailing wind from the west. We've got leaky building, leaking ductwork, leaking pipes. And then we've got groundwater uh, running through there. See, there's no groundwater here. It's all right. We just bury it. Just look at all of those springs on the side of the hill. There's there's the clear creek running through there. There's a head of water there. Percolates through. Comes out all of these springs along here. Here we buried it here. Runs through there. Runs down into the Platte River and into those wells over there across the river. You couldn't pick a better way to contaminate that part of the country, mm -hmm. either from the air or from the ground. Well, when it kind of made sense with them, then they've been, uh, well, now we're going to hush it up. Well, let's, let's promote this game reserve, get fish and game to take the land. I can't believe they were dumb enough to realize they were under a law that said if they inherit the property, they also inherit the problems. And they, uh, they are realizing it now. Yeah. So it kind of slowed down. Yeah. But all the while, we're wondering, well, we still got to clean it up. They brushed over it a little bit mm -hmm. and said, okay, it's cleaned up now. Several times you see in the big head in the paper, it's all done now. Well, it isn't. But it sounds like your original cleanup commission was the first. Examine the problem. Exam to look at that problem. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, and uh -huh. then, then they carried that back to their uh, city council and all that. Right. And they said, well, how are we involved and what shall we do about it? I wasn't privy to any of those meetings, but I imagine they said, mm -hmm. can we cover it up? Can we bury it up? Or, mm -hmm. or can we just ignore it? Yeah. Bill, were you <laughs> involved in any of the city uh, uh, negotiations in, in any of the cities around Rocky Flats? Uh, well, we were not confined <laughs> exactly to the Rocky Flats area, yeah. but we did what we felt was important. But we didn't uh, get into much politics. As mm -hmm. a mayor of one town, I forget his name, he used to uh, come to our meetings, and he was uh -huh. very interested because he was a mayor of whatever these little communities. Yes. Yeah. They wanted to know and carry it back, so we damn sure didn't like to meet with the city council. Right. Or the city public people and tell them what we thought. It had yeah. to be tailored for that presentation. Yeah. <laughs> and we weren't part of that tailoring. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't I just, I don't know what the hell is. A very, a very effective member of our group who uh, unfortunately died before the group's work hasn't really finished yet, but is Joe Goldfield. Yes. Uh -huh. That always happens. Right after the uh, FBI raid, the general manager of the plant got cancer and died. And the assistant, all the guys that could confirm what I was alleging died. And I asked them, isn't that strange? Said, yeah, Jim. it's even suspicious. It's not part of your case. Jim. I was surprised at how callous they were. They yeah. damn near got fired there because I didn't have a chance of, of getting any evidence. This was my third set of attorneys to go into it. And you'll see this is, these big Washington firms don't go into it if there's any chance of losing. Yeah. But if it's big enough, they'll take it, which they have. Yeah. Jim feels uh, rather suspicious about that. Uh, some of this activity. <laughs> of course, there's a lot, a tremendous sum of money involved yeah. if uh, 
Well, what's, uh, what's the company that has the biggest stake in this? Uh, Boeing, Boeing, and pardon, Boeing and Rockwell, both Rockwell, are twenty-five yeah. billion dollars a year. Rockwell has a uh, large amount. Uh, there's a. Uh, there was another group set up. Uh, you probably know know of them. Uh, the uh, besides Boeing and uh, uh, Asian, and Rockwell. No, uh, Kaiser Hill. I'm thinking of uh, Agent Orange and something else, and the gentleman who is an active spirit in this group uh, is unfortunately since uh, died, but uh, maybe he didn't know him. You know who I'm referring to? Bill, how did you um, feel when you learned, of, when you moved out here and learned about Rocky Flats and what they were making? Um, how did you feel about that? Did you did you think it was important to make nuclear weapons, or did you have concerns about it? Well, I am, a war effort. I am, you might say, anti-nuclear weapons. Uh -huh. I, I wish that uh, different countries weren't involved in competing with one another, turning out these nuclear weapons. I, I think they're a real hazard to mankind. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you see, I have to rely on Bill entirely for the physics and chemistry of this bomb-making business. I, I can see contamination from a number of sources and in, uh, faulty engineering, but Bill was raised in this industry and realized its serious potential from a health standpoint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Much less just killing the hour. Yeah, yeah. So you've devoted a lot of, of your time since you retired in working on this, is that right? Uh, I won't let him retire. This wasn't, none of this involved any pay. Right, I understand uh, that. It uh, was all volunteer, right? Yes. And, uh, the compensation I got was the people I was working with who were uh, fun people to work with, and uh, also the uh, it was interesting attending the meetings. So compensation wasn't necessary. Compensation came in the pleasure of uh, going to the meetings, learning new things, and learn certain aspects of the testing that were going on. Things that were involved that I wouldn't have known otherwise. Yeah. So uh, it was a fun project. Uh -huh. Good. How do you feel now about the planned wildlife refuge? How do I feel about what? About the wildlife refuge plan as it is now. How do you feel oh, about that? Well, I feel there's a, a certain amount of danger attached to turning it over to the public as a uh, playground and as a, uh, a wildlife <laughs> refuge. Uh, it, it's awfully hard to contain uh, the, the stuff once it's put down in the soil or whatever. Uh, animals eat the plants and then carry it around, dis distribute it through the feces some other place, and uh, uh, plants grow. It's a uh, not a simple thing. And one of the lessons uh, I, that, that I and the Navy learned much earlier, at a much earlier date, is when these tests were conducted in the Pacific, these so-called bikini atom bomb tests, that the uh, material, the radioactive material, was so hard to contain once it was spread around. Uh, at Bikini, they planned to be too uh, two major tests, uh, an underwater uh, uh, explosion of a bomb underneath an array of ships and an airdrop in which a bomb was dropped, the airdrop would came first, in which a bomb was dropped from 30,000 feet and exploded at uh, maybe 2,000 feet or so over the center of the target array. And uh, as a result of these 
two explosions, uh, radioactive material was spread around and uh, on the decks of the ships and on the equipment of the ships, the clothing that the men wore, their boots and so on, were all contaminated. And uh, it was awfully hard to contain this material and to clean it up after it was, it, it was there. The uh, decks of the ships were, had become radioactive, because of the test, had become radioactive. And uh, it was awfully hard to clean this radioactive material off the decks of the ship. And we had all kinds of uh, ruses to try to clean it up. They had the sailors, one of the first things to do after some of the tests at Bikini were to get the deck a wash of the uh, radioactive material. And they had the uh, sailors scrubbing the, the decks. Uh, and uh, that was probably more dangerous than they realized at the time, but also it was le far less productive of the results that they wanted than they expected also. Yeah. Yeah. And their resistance to sleeping below deck. They wanted to sleep on top of the deck because it was cooler up there. It was hotter than hell down here. <laughs> and then the, the attitude of the general public to the hazard is hard to explain. They, wasn't, they weren't that courageous. courageous. They just were not interested. And they were in serious danger. Especially those Navy boys trying disobeying the orders to sleep below deck instead of on top of it. But they really didn't understand it, did they? No. And they, they wasn't, uh, oh, not exactly evidence. There was evidence, but not the evidence that they would be exposed to. Well, well, let's see. We just have about just a couple more minutes on this tape. Um, I think we've covered most of the things that, you know, I wanted you to talk about. Is there anything else that occurs to you that you would want future generations to know? I would uh, hope that we would, uh, the, nations of the world, nations of the world would stop making uh, uh, and competing with one another with uh, atom bombs. Uh, first of all, it's a, uh, a very, uh, the results of uh, the, the preparation of the material and the use of the material spreads this uh, stuff around that I'd rather see contained naturally as it is and not uh, not uh, unearthed and uh, made available for erosion and so on processes to occur that uh, would spread the stuff. And uh, other thoughts on it are uh, if we have to have a war, kill soldiers and civilians, uh, that's, uh, uh, we've done that for many generations before, and it's nasty business, but uh, I think it's become lots nastier since uh, atom bombs have been introduced. Uh, the manufacture of the bombs and the use of the bombs has uh, resulted in probably the poisoning of lots of people. Uh, I don't think it's fully known, fully understood to the extent, but uh, Someday we'll know about it. Well, maybe that's a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs>